All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Cooper, Health Commissioner at Public Health Dayton, Montgomery County. Thank you for being here today so where we can provide an update to our community on the COVID-19 pandemic. We're very pleased today that we have several speakers again. We have Commissioner Carolyn Rice from the Board of County Commissioners for Montgomery County, Mayor Nan Whaley from the City of Dayton, Sarah Hackenbrack from the Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association, and then Michael Doan, Public Health Medical Director. So today on the Governor's News Conference, and I'm assuming most of us watched that again, um, had an update on the state's plans regarding increasing testing capacity, especially for hospitals to, who have collected test specimens to get those to a, to a hospital that can quickly turn around the test results. That's very encouraging, as well as his discussions around increasing availability of swabs and test tube media, as well as reagents for the testing machines. So that's all encouraging news. We also heard an, a brief update uh, regarding the Ohio National Guard and their work with our hospital systems and the Ohio Department of Health in terms of building out capacity, surge capacity for our hospital systems. They're applying the lessons learned from other countries as well as other states because we're currently planning to have two times the capacity that we currently have. And so facility build out off site off the hospital campus is gonna be very important in many regions, including ours. And work's ongoing with our hospital systems, the Ohio National Guard, uh, the um, public health, as well as various other entities. So Army Corps of Engineers, for example. So everyone really contributing to make sure that we can care for our population. We've spoken repeatedly in the past about confirmed cases and all of the limitations associated with reporting the confirmed number of cases. But you heard Director Acton from the Ohio Department of Health today also indicate that they're gonna start creating additional data sets and posting them on the Ohio Department of Health dashboard and specifically she was referencing zip code level data. We all understand that we have community spread and that because of that, the confirmed number of cases will always be much, much lower than the actual number of cases that are occurring in a community, right? There are, there's limited test kits available. 80% uh, of people that we know that get the disease will simply self-care at home. It may oftentimes never be reported, as well as keep in mind, and this is very important, individuals without symptoms can still shed the virus they're still infected. So all of that, as, you, as we create zip code level data maps, we need to use an abundance of caution in terms of how we are using those data. So public health has just today posted some zip code level maps, data maps of confirmed cases on our website. It's a document that has cases by zip code in the state of Ohio, cases by zip code in our west central planning region, which includes eight counties, and then by zip code in Montgomery County. Again, use those data with an abundance of caution because we all understand that we have community spread and we need to assume, quite frankly, that anyone you come in contact with may be carrying that virus. When you look at those maps, though, on our website, when you look at the zip code data, what you're gonna see, and please don't assume that there's more of a problem in one zip code area than another. You'll see that there's probably been more testing that has occurred in higher income areas. So those maps kind of reinforce what we've always reported in our community health assessment, that purple book that I referred to yesterday. And that is the majority of our minority and low income communities as well as marginalized populations have less, less access to care. And that very likely is certainly occurring as well when we're talking about COVID-19 disease. So use the maps with an abundance of caution. They're one tool, but they certainly do not paint the entire picture. So we thought we would end, at least from a public health perspective this week, with some weekend recommendations. We've all seen now the revised stay-at-home orders from the governor and the director of the Ohio Department of Health. So as the weather starts to get better, yes, we should all be going outside, but we still need to maintain our separation of distance. Um, 
Parks and trails, those are really important, but try to avoid overcrowding at parks. And this is a tough one, but we really need to adhere to it. Do not have parties at your home, including deck parties. That simply is not appropriate. You're going to pass the virus among your, yourself and others um, in the event that people are at your house. Um, don't have children play dates and sleepovers and things like that. This is, we think this is common sense, but unfortunately it's probably still occurring. So we need to pay attention to the details. Don't use playground equipment, no team sports, and as we've all been trying, trying to practice, check on those that you care about, your family, those who are elderly, your neighbors, just make sure they're okay, make sure you're social distancing. If you have to go to a grocery store or a pharmacy, go by yourself, try to go at an hour or a time when it's not crowded. And then if you are at, an over, at a big box store, and obviously it's that time of year where we're all trying to go out to Home Depots and Lowe's and other places to do things around the house and work on our yards and so forth, just go to get necessary items. And I know that's hard to, to adhere to, but it's really important. Toilet in your house is broken, what are you gonna do with all that toilet paper, right? Yes, go to get a toilet. Mulch, wind chimes, flowers, things like that, those are not essential. Those are not necessities of life right now. And so we're gonna ask you to avoid overcrowding at these big box stores because the virus is going to pass among individuals that are crowding into those stores. And so then obviously use common sense, adhere to the orders, we're at critical stages. We know we're headed towards a peak in cases sometime between April 15th and May 15th. We need to do everything we can as individuals to make sure that we're separating ourselves from others, we're complying with the stay at home order, and we're trying to help each other and protect our community. And so with that, we'll leave obviously any type of update regarding essential businesses to the end because I assume there will be a variety of questions. And with that, I would like to welcome Carolyn Rice to the microphone. Good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Montgomery County Commissioner Carolyn Rice, and it's my pleasure to be here today. What I'd like to do this afternoon is to provide you with an update on public assistance and workforce programs. Now, as many of you know, the U.S. Small Business Administration recently announced the Paycheck Protection Program, which will allow small businesses to keep workers on their payroll during the pandemic. The program is described as a loan, but the SBA will forgive the loans if all employees are kept on the payroll for eight weeks, and the money is used for payroll, rent, mortgage interest, or utilities. I also want to mention that the program applies to self-employed and 1099 contract workers. That program was launched today, so check it out to learn more. Secondly, we continue to encourage anyone who has lost work due to COVID-19 to apply for unemployment using your phone or computer at unemployment.ohio.gov. Now for anyone actively seeking a job, Montgomery County's workforce development team is still working with companies who are hiring. Interested applicants can call 937-225-JOBS. Again, 937 225 5627 or jobs. You can also access resources online at www.thejobcenter.org where we're keeping a list of businesses who are currently hiring. Now, our public uh, assistance division has seen a daily increase in the number of our citizens who are applying for social services. People can apply for multiple benefits programs such as food assistance and Medicaid through the county shared services line, which is 1-844-640-6446. I'll say that again. 1-844-640-6446. Call center hours are 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. 
Also, the new virtual hold feature saves people from waiting on hold. When it's their turn in line, they will be called back. Citizens can also apply online at ssp.benefits.ohio.gov. Now this week, the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services began offering click and collect grocery shopping, allowing citizens using their EBT cards to shop from home and pick up their groceries in a parking lot. Many retailers are now offering this service for free to cut down on food traffic during the pandemic. If stores have point of sale devices, SNAP recipients can swipe their EBT cards in the store parking lot as they pick up their groceries. If the stores do not have these point of sale devices, people can still pre-order groceries and pay in the store, eliminating the need to circulate throughout the store. The Ohio Department of Job and Family Services has also extended the SNAP benefits recertification eligibility periods for March, April, and May by six months. This will ease some pressure on family assistance workers who are process processing more new SNAP cases. The finally, I just want to share some resources for citizens who may speak other languages. COVID-19 information and updates are available in Spanish at www.somosdayton.com, and I'll spell that out, www.somosdayton.com. Another good site is MV, mvcovid19eviction.com, and this is for renters needing information about how to stay in their residence during this emergency. The site is currently available in English, Spanish, and Turkish, but I am told that Arabic and French will be up soon. Our website, the Montgomery County website, also has translation services on our web pages, and that site, our website, is www.mcohio.org. Um, thank you uh, for allowing me to join you today. On behalf of my fellow county commissioners, Judy Dodge and Debbie Lieberman, I'd like to also thank all of our county employees who are working to support their fellow citizens and local businesses during this difficult time. But in fact, we, like everyone in this room, are so grateful to all the workers across our county and the region that are providing vital services to our community throughout this crisis. To each and every one of you, thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Commissioner Rice. Now we'd like to bring Mayor Nan Whaley to the podium. Good afternoon, just a couple of brief updates today. Appreciate Commissioner Rice giving the updates on where you can get services and just a couple of pieces of advice today too, Commissioner Cooper. Uh, first, this, this afternoon, or I think this morning, I was on a, um, a, tel a, t a virtual, everything is virtual now, a virtual town hall with Lieutenant Governor John Husted, Mayor Andy Ginther, and about 10 different businesses from the group called 10,000 Small Businesses that we are lucky enough uh, to be a community that participates in this. And there were actually two local businesses, Vocal Link, which is providing important services uh, for translation, and then also Pamela Ellis, who does work um, on educational resources, really talking about the effect that small businesses are having. And the first bus small businesses that we really experienced having this issue were restaurants and bars. So as SBA, and we've heard a lot about that today and yesterday, begins to <laughs> ramp up and have this, uh, this effort to be able to do paycheck work, et cetera, I want to encourage everyone to be patient. Uh, these systems, unfortunately, like we've seen in unemployment, do not work well with the number of people coming through them. So we really need to encourage everyone to do their best to get the paperwork through, to be very patient with these because they will be frustrating. Just as we can come and click our groceries, which now can take three to four days, we have to plan more in time and make sure that we're taking the time 
and really exercise patience is one of the things we're all learning through this pandemic disaster. Uh, but this weekend should be great weather, so I want to re-echo Commissioner Cooper's uh, plea to get outside, but please keep your distance. Right now, the parks in the city of Dayton and the Five River Metro Parks are open, but if we cannot maintain distance, we will not be able to continue to do that through this month of April. So we're counting on you to do your part, to get outside, but keep your distance. And if you are, if you see a park that is too busy, go to another park. Okay, this is a really important message because we really want to keep these parks open. I think they help with the quality of life and help us all keep some sanity. Uh, so I want to make sure that you all en encourage you all to do that this weekend while uh, keeping distance. You might want to think of, of you know, using the 400 miles of trails. That's easier to keep your distance than just wandering in one of the parks as well. For this weekend, I think the other thing, I think if you're watching the uh, governor and lieutenant governor's press conference every day, maybe Commissioner Cooper, people aren't as obsessed as you, Sarah, and I are on them, but we are. Uh, you can tell he is signaling around masks. So what I would suggest, and Gadaha has been great about providing exactly how to make these masks. I've put them on my Facebook page, but I know it's on Gadaha's site as well. Is consider getting in your basement, finding some fabric. It's not that much fabric and considering making yourself some masks because I think that's where we're going next week. I'll be doing that this weekend. That's my big plan for the weekend is to make some masks for myself. Uh, uh, but it is going to be, I think, the next thing that we need to prepare for. And so I encourage everybody to spend some time this weekend preparing for that. We don't want to use the very uh, scarce and precious resources of PPE. That's why we really need people to start making their own. So share with friends on Facebook. Maybe someone can put one in your mailbox. If you don't have the ability to do that, I'm sure there will be lots of friendly mask uh, um, shares going on. But I think we need to prepare for that this weekend, and I know that's what I'll be doing as well. So please enjoy the weekend. Please stay safe. Please stay patient, and please keep your distance. Have a good one. Thank you, Mayor Whaley. Now, Sarah Hackenbrack from the Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Hackenbrack with the Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association, and we work with member hospitals in 11 different counties, 29 hospitals and health systems across the Greater Dayton region. And quite frequently, uh, especially in our current times, I am asked, are our hospitals really working together? Are they really collaborating in preparation for what is to come with COVID-19? And I want to share unequivocally, unequivocally and unquestionably, yes, our hospitals are working together in close collaboration and close concert with one another. And I share that with you today because we had one of the most unique experiences that I have ever had the, the privilege of being part of today where we spent most of the day with our new partners at the Ohio National Guard, introducing them to our level one and level two trauma centers here in the Dayton area, and physically showing them the spaces that we are creating in our hospitals and in our healthcare environment to increase capacity to be prepared to care for COVID-19 patients right here in the Dayton region in our hospitals and healthcare facilities. And that allowed us not only to show the National Guard the work and the preparation that is being done in our region, but it allowed us to show leadership from different hospital organizations, different healthcare organizations and systems, the deep level of preparation that we are all putting forth to prepare for what is coming ahead of us. And so I do want to assure all of you that yes, our hospitals are actively working together right now as we build out those surge capacity plans and we build our internal capacity and then we work with our external partners and we work with our community-based partners like Public Health, Dayton and Montgomery County, like the City of Dayton, like Montgomery County and the Montgomery County Emergency Management Agency as we need to build that external crisis community capacity those conversations are also actively taking place behind the scenes so that if we need to, we would be prepared to care for people in an alternate care site outside of one of the healthcare facilities. Again, Commissioner Cooper mentioned some of the remarks that Governor DeWine shared and Dr. Amy Acton shared in regards to testing. And I think it's really important to remind the public that right now we are still in a phase where testing is limited in the state of Ohio. There are active conversations and there are active processes being put in place to increase 
the capability for testing, but right now our capacity to test is limited. And that capacity is limited based on the testing materials, so the testing media and the swabs and the reagent that are so specific to this type of test we have to get more of that into the state of Ohio and into our region before we can actually start to increase our capacity to test more individuals in Ohio. And with that, there are a number of opportunities. As soon as we can start to increase our testing ability, we will know and be able to confirm our number of confirmed cases throughout the region and give more clear guidance when it comes to social isola isolation and direction to individuals that may have been impacted by COVID-19. So thank you for the work that you are doing. Thank you for following the governor's stay at home order so specifically. I know as we go into this weekend, it is going to be a wonderful opportunity to get out, socialize, but to do so at a safe distance where you're six feet away from one another, but get out, enjoy our great parks, our great walking trails and get some sunshine so that you can also take care of your heart and your soul. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next, we have Michael Doan, Medical Director at Public Health Dayton, Montgomery County. I think I hear the crowd roaring. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Doan. I'm Medical Director for Public Health Dayton, Montgomery County. Recently, I talked about the fact that the information we track routinely showed a 30% drop in emergency room visits. We got the data today for last week. That drop has continued to go down. And so the capacity of our emergency rooms is really open for whatever may be coming and we can be well prepared. This also means that staff for the emergency rooms don't have to be there being possibly exposed. They can be safe at home and be in reserve for when they are, are needed. The other thing I wanna talk about today is cell phones, okay? Um, I've got mine in my pocket. Like most of you, it just goes everywhere with me. As any of us that have watched modern police and detective dramas know, <laughs> they can track suspects with their cell phone and what towers they ping off of. And so it is a way to kind of see how people are moving about, okay? The I'm not sure how I'm gonna do this, but I could try and get help, but anybody would have to be closer than six feet, <laughs> and so I'm not sure that that <laughs> is gonna work. Get some help if, you if, I get, if I just hold it up here, mm -hmm. is that seeable? Okay, sure. so this is a comparison from the end of February, February 28th, until about March 26th. And what they did is they took aggregate data from cell phones that just kind of wraps everybody together. And they said, where are the cell phones moving? And how much were the cell phones, which are really trackers for people, how much were they moving February 28th and how much were they moving on March 26th? The red here at this end, this is no change. That would be normal travel compared to February. And down at this end is where it's very light is no travel. And this kind of rosy area here is about half as much travel, okay? I think the remarkable thing is that within the, our area here, this is Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin's a little bit pinker, but not too much. And then New York, which of course had tremendous problems and shut down everything, okay? We see that is quite distinct from the rest of the country. One of the things that happened, New York started there, um, kind of social distancing and all those measures after they started to have some cases, all right? In Ohio, it started 31 days ago when the governor said, I'm gonna cancel the Arnold Classic, okay? That was followed by discussions about the NCAA. That was followed about discussions about other kinds of social distancing and shutting things down. That was before we had any cases in Ohio, all right? So that these states, Michigan's got cases. They started a little bit later because they had some cases again, so they've got cases, but they've shut down very much like New York has. But for these cases in the states down here, we haven't had much in terms of cases yet. We got started very early, and so this is just another indication that we're doing a good job in Ohio. Just like Montgomery County, we're staying out of the emergency room. 
for staying home. You're doing what we need to do to try and make this work out. Um, and the same thing with just travel around the state has just dropped off tremendously. This has some implications for the future, which I think we're gonna have to deal with. That is, we may come through this better than the surrounding areas. We may have less people sick, less people that die, but it means we may also have more people that have never had the infection, don't have any immunity. And that means that these other areas around us may still have sick people that could come and sort of reintroduce it to us, okay? And so I think part of the, the decisions about how these measures come off and how this is gonna work out have to take into account the travel that occurs in down the different places in the United States, how we all intermingle, and who has done a really good job with this and who has not really kind of bought into this whole kind of uh, flattening the curve in the same way. This will be up on our website, right? We can, we can put it there. Okay. And, you know, so that you can take a look at it. It comes from the New York Times. If you have access to the Times online, you can find it there with a very nice discussion about what the, uh, the implications are. I'd also like to thank Dr. Andarcio, who on a uh, Montgomery County Medical Society call that was uh, talking about the coronavirus pointed this out. Um, so I don't have too much more to say about that, except that once again, as a population, we're doing a pretty good job. Yeah, I think so. I had something else, just a minute. Oh, I was gonna say something else about the masks, okay? I just wanna emphasize again that the kind of homemade masks we're talking about, that's to protect someone wearing the mask from spreading something to someone else. It may have some protection for me if I'm wearing it, but mostly it's if I'm likely to spread it. We're finding more and more, as was mentioned, that, that asymptomatic people can spread this virus. And I tell you, every morning I wake up and I check my temperature and it's okay. I check my symptoms and I'm all right. And I think, you know, I may have been exposed yesterday I may be asymptomatic, I may have this virus reproducing in my throat, and I may be able to spread it to people and I don't even know it, okay? So that's the reasoning behind these masks. It's really sort of a courtesy, if you will, to other people so that we don't unwittingly pass it to our family, pass it to people that we pass in the grocery store or wherever else we may be. So I think it's going to become a thing where it's going to really be seen as sort of a individual social responsibility. So I don't sew. I need I'll someone. Keep doing it. Okay, people will make me masks. Yeah. <laughs> always, always depended on the kindness of strangers and things. Um, so that's all really I have to say. But the, Mr. Cooper's gonna come back and talk some about the businesses. If there are questions. If there are questions only, okay. So are there any questions at this point? I was just gonna say, until someone, until Mayor Whaley offered to make one for Mickey, I think we were all gonna be on edge in terms of how he was gonna design his mask and what it was gonna look like when he came back this <laughs> next week, so, this yeah. Anyways, all right, are there questions? Um, has the list on the 12 businesses that were served those orders been released? So yeah, so the question is, has the list on the businesses that will be served cease and desist orders been released? And the answer is yes. Those individual letters that we issued today for cease and desist operations uh, are on the public health website at phdmc.org. And the list is actually 18 businesses that were deemed non-essential. And I think it's really important also to stress that those businesses also need to understand that none of this is personal. Public health is not purposefully trying to treat them differently than anyone else. But it's very clear that we have a stay at home order from the director of the Ohio Department of Health. And non-essential businesses and operations, number two in that order, must cease. We are simply enforcing that order. 
And so the list is on our website, those letters of the, of the businesses that we visited today, 18 of them, accompanied by law enforcement to assure that those businesses remain closed. Can I just update that? The, the list is being updated as the businesses are being notified. So the full 18 is not up there yet, but it's yeah. well, being the, added. The letters are up there that, we, that will be up there that we sent out. Also, keep in mind that list that's on the website, as we go through and validate all that information, we'll take off organizations that are deemed to be in compliance. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, that list included University of Dayton testing site. They are no longer on that list because it was not a valid complaint. It was more along the lines of someone being frustrated that it was taking so long to get their test result back. I know you guys have had over a thousand calls on complaints and everything like that. So what kind of determined who was put on that list that was posted yesterday? So the question is, we've had over a thousand calls. What determines who was on that list? Actually, that number is over 3,000 calls. And so when you look through the list of all the complaints that we've received, it's very clear based on what's specifically indicated in the stay-at-home order that that's a non-essential business. I'll give you some examples. Pet grooming locations. So there are one, two, three, four, five or so, five or six pet grooming locations. It's clear those are non-essential. CR butts. Pretty clear that's a smoke shop non-essential. GameStop, multiple locations, video type store, non-essential. Monkey Smoke Shop, non-essential. Bell Comics, yes, if you like comic books, that's great, but they're non-essential, so they cease and desist operations. Zero One Vape in Kettering, non-essential. Adult triple X toys, clearly non-essential, and exotic fantasies. Perhaps we should clarify non-essential for most, right? So again, those are non-essential businesses. Nothing personal against those. Um, so anyways, the list is on there. We'll continue to review the, the full list. And as we identify those that are not in compliance, either they're non-essential or they are not meeting the social distancing requirements required, then they'll, they'll receive a cease and desist order as well. I did speak to one of those business owners who was on the list um, yeah. yesterday. They were upset about it, said they've been following the rules. Again, we stressed what you said didn't mean they were not, you know, they were being not compliant. But what would you say to those businesses who, who feel that way at this point? So it's pretty clear that yesterday the governor has created a, I think the name of it is a, a dispute resolution panel. So if someone is truly, truly believes that we've made the wrong decision locally, they have two options. They can get back in touch with us and walk through again the information that they've submitted. But if it doesn't change our mind based on how we are applying consistently the criteria, then they can go through the state process, the dispute resolution panel for a state decision. Can you speak more on that process? I do not. The question is, can we speak more about the state dispute resolution process? We do not have information on that process right now. And so those businesses that you observed, were they more non-essential or were they not focusing on the social distancing? The ones, so the question is, with the businesses served today, were they more non-essential or were they not focusing on the social distancing requirements? They were deemed non-essential businesses. Any other questions? Well, we have someone on the oh, phone wait. here. Oh, okay. uh, oh, wait, she has another question. Okay, another question? One more question. Do you guys have questions? No? Good question. For Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> We can't give any details about what we showed today and what we showed yesterday because those are all still active conversations and no final determinations have been made.
but what I can say is that they have been active and engaged partners with us coming into our local community and actually really helping us evaluate the options that we have so that we as a community can make sure that we make the best choices for what we think we might need in the future, and that is in terms of a crisis care capacity. Thank you. Let's just check with the phone and see if anybody on the phone has a call or question. The questions from anyone on the phone? Hello? Okay. Somebody there? Hello. <laughs> Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I have a question. This is not about the businesses. Um, I noticed on the ODH website um, that there was um, a second um, death um, attributed to Montgomery County. Do you know um, anything about that second death? So the question is, there was on the ODH website, there was a second death attributed to a Montgomery County resident. At this time, I do, we do not have information on that death. Okay. Yes, you do. I don't have did, so, did someone else join the call? I thought I heard another caller there. I'm not sure. Is this an open line? This is... Um, Yes. Sounds, I see. It's not queued up. Hi, this is Adam Wright from Channel 2 here. I have a question for Mayor Whaley about small businesses. Okay. Hi, Adam. Hi there, Mayor. Appreciate the time. I'm wondering, after today's virtual town hall, is there any new action the city is able to take or the area is able to take to help small businesses stay afloat? And how do you feel about the threat that some small businesses may not be able to bounce back? The question was, is there action from the city around helping small businesses or work to help keep them afloat? Uh, and am I worried about some of them not being able to bounce back? Uh, you know, this was a discussion uh, the other commissioners have as well. Uh, keep in mind, we, uh, the city, have furloughed over 600 workers because when people aren't working, then there's no income tax for the city even. So everybody is contracting in a way um, that they have never anticipated before. And as much as we would like to be able to give relief uh, from our very small budget, we're not able to do that. What we have been doing is constantly advocating, both for small business um, owners, uh, which is one of the reasons why I was uh, glad to be on the virtual town hall today, and then also for people that are seeking unemployment and getting unemployment. This is going to be a crisis and is a crisis uh, both health-wise and economically, quite frankly, that we have never seen before in this country, right? So, you know, people can talk about the pandemic of the 1918 flu. We didn't know enough in 1918 to do social distancing. So, you know, it's way, way different today. And so I think folks, and this is painful, because especially if you're talking about the economic uh, matters, and it's painful for me as mayor, that, you know, we spend all of our time thinking of how we can create jobs and give economic sustainability, and we are ripping that away right now in order for keeping people safe and saving lives. And that is a very painful process we're all going through. Uh, we have to do our best to get through that, and as the governor says, once we uh, do the health part, we'll do the, ec the ec economy part. And so, you know, we're having constant conversation with our partners in state and federal government on what that looks like. It's just very difficult right now to model because we have to get through this health epidemic. Um, I will say too, I've been just amazed by the generosity of the local businesses in Dayton. Uh, there were stories today, um, and this was in the state, of uh, small businesses that were restaurants that were feeding their um, employees. Because quite frankly, they're still pending on unemployment. And so you see that that's happening all across the community. We encourage particularly those that are having issues with unemployment to call 211 right now. We know there's going to be a few weeks here that this is just going to be such a challenge. And so those are the resources that we're using for, for folks right now is the 211 site. Okay, Adam? follow-up? Yeah. What's your follow-up? Uh, one quick, one quick follow-up. Sure. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay. Um, we hear from these businesses that the demand is not going away. Coronavirus is not going to remove the demand for a restaurant or a non-essential business through this process. But what are you hearing from some of the business owners about the difficulties of stopping and starting back up or weathering this storm, however long it may be? 
Well, I, the question was the demand's not going away post corona, and I hope they're right, particularly for restaurants and bars. But I, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that we're gonna, our behavior is going to change in ways we don't know yet after this virus. And I'll give one example that I think, you know, no one said this, but I think this is true. Uh, you know, retail, for example, was already being disrupted. The way people were purchasing items, they were not going to the stores. And we saw that with L Brands closing and all these other businesses closing, unless it was like a really local and unique place. Uh, now everyone is buying even more online based on the social distancing. So I think retail will be very different after this pandemic. You know, I don't know what will happen on restaurants and bars, but I am very concerned because these are places that do work month to month. And they're not, they're not big businesses like Walmart or Procter & Gamble, but they are the lifeblood of our community. And so our job as local elected officials is to advocate, to share their stories, and to fight like hell for them once we're through this health epidemic. Much appreciated. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Adam.